June of 1965, an opportunity was afforded personnel from the Space and Information Systems Division of North American Aviation to visit Vietnam to observe U.S. Navy participation in that area. The Ocean Systems and Life Sciences Departments had been engaged in several studies and contracts relating to counterinsurgency, and it was felt that if the technical capabilities available at SNID were to be constructively applied, a first-hand understanding of both Navy operations and the Vietnam environment must be provided. In-country clearances were granted by Thomas McVie through the Naval Advisory Group, and on the 24th of June, three NAA personnel arrived at Tonsonet Airport. Quarters were provided by the Navy at a military BOQ in the Saigon area. Virtually all hotels in Saigon have been taken over by the military for BOQs, and quarters range from the very plush Caravelle to the many less deluxe hotels. Security is a major problem in the Saigon area as highlighted by a sniper bullet, which had penetrated the window at the Brink Hotel BOQ during the happy hour. It was this hotel in central Saigon where 60 servicemen were injured on Christmas Eve in 1964 as a result of a Viet Cong attack. The threat of Viet Cong terrorist attack became very real when the Vicon restaurant was bombed with Claymore mines the second night after arrival. This popular restaurant was located only one and a half blocks from the Majestic Hotel, where quarters had been provided for the NAA personnel. Forty-two persons were killed, with an additional 80 injured. The next day, elaborate funeral processions were in evidence, such as this Chinese procession. The Mykon restaurant was open for business, as usual, only four days after the bombing. One of the primary involvements of the U.S. Navy is in an advisory capacity to the Vietnamese River Forces, Coastal District, and the main shipyard in Saigon. Primary effort at this activity is construction of the Yabuda Junk for use by the Junk Divisions located around the coastal periphery of Vietnam. The Yabuda Junk is constructed from very heavy, dense wood with close rib spacing and is an especially rugged vessel. It has good clean lines and is capable of moderate speed. It was jointly designed by the Vietnamese together with the U.S. Navy advisor. It has a diesel propulsion plant, is fiberglass covered, has quadrant steering and rudder. Approximately 50 of these junks have been built at the present time, and the shipyard was capable of producing 10 per week as of June. Transportation in the Saigon area is obviously an extreme problem at the present time, and as can be seen, the primary mode of transportation is the bicycle or motorcycle. The Rex Hotel is another major U.S. military BOQ, and because of recent bombings, additional protection is afforded through barricades in the street. As one meets various U.S. military personnel, they enjoy pointing out the ease with which the Viet Cong can ambush these various military BOQs from adjacent buildings. This causes some concern to the visitor. The Saigon River forms a so-called safe perimeter. However, as can be seen, access across the river by the Viet Cong can be accomplished with ease. Most ships tied up at docks in this area are on full alert, especially at night. Quarters were provided through the Navy at the Majestic Hotel, which is utilized by many of the non-military foreign visitors to the Saigon area. An insufficient number of Americans are quartered at this hotel to warrant an MP guard, thus the only security is afforded by a lone Vietnamese policeman. All the people normally encountered, such as the hotel bellboys, merchants, and so forth, are entertaining and appear to particularly enjoy the American visitor. Although the presence of Americans in many cases increases the possibility of the VC bombing their particular business establishment. The activities at the Tonsonet Airport are best described as wall-to-wall -wall aircraft. Logistics aircraft are continually lined up waiting for takeoff clearances 
and intermixed their many F-100, B-57, and F-105 aircraft, which fly several bombing missions per day. Huey helicopters are constantly taking off and landing, either to evacuate wounded or on strike support missions. Each flight to and from the Saigon area again impresses one with the extreme size of the Saigon Cholon area with its 10 million people living mostly in small shacks. On 28 June, a flight was made over the eastern portion of the Mekong Delta region known as the Rungsat. The strategic hamlet seen here does not leave one with the impression of security. With 100% of the surrounding area of BC controlled, and the only U.S. access either through helicopters or by the river. Vung Tau, or Cape St. Jacques, is a famous resort area and is currently utilized for R&R by all military, including the Viet Cong. The marketplace at Vung Tau provided interest for the team's life science visitor, especially some of the more tasty dishes. Of particular interest is the fact this market activity disappears during the siesta time from 12 o'clock to 2 p.m., completely down to the last banana. The Jeep ride to the Coastal Surveillance Center, located in an old lighthouse in the Vung Tower area, presents one with some impression of the ambush problem. As in virtually all of Vietnam, the jungle growth is extremely dense and hiding any number of VC military troops is obviously easy. One is struck with the extreme beauty of this area, and it is hard to believe that a war is actually taking place, although certainly the heavy barbed wire barricades remind one of the extreme threat. As in the case in Saigon and all cities, the outer boundary of the city is considered the limits of the safe area, and the U.S. military are advised to carry around in the chamber when passing beyond that boundary. 100% of the surrounding territory is considered to be controlled by the Viet Cong. The 32nd Junk Division base and repair facility were also visited in the Katlo area. The new Yabuda junk had not been supplied to most junk divisions as of that time, and the repair of existing junks was a heavy commitment. Obviously, modern tools are still unknown, despite the efforts of many very dedicated advisors. The command junks in use mount a single 30 caliber machine gun and carry small arms. Seen here, two Vietnamese junks are bringing in a Viet Cong suspect fishing junk. Security for the U.S. Naval advisors at Tung Tau is a primary problem, as the barbed wire just beyond the sandbag emplacement constitutes Viet Cong territory. Several suggestions were made with regard to increasing security but these did not meet with necessarily a high degree of interest. The airfield at Vung Tau is used by the Special Forces, the U.S. Army, Vietnamese military, as well as Air Vietnam Commercial Airlines. Of interest is the fact that Air Vietnam has never had an accident and is not shot at by the Viet Cong, although they fly to virtually all areas in South Vietnam. By the time our party left to return to Saigon, the monsoon rains, which occurred three to four times daily, were in evidence again, and the trip up the Saigon River was extremely rough. As can be seen, a large portion of the Mekong Delta is underwater during certain portions of the day. In addition to visiting in-country naval advisors, Arrangements were made to visit the carriers Carl C. and the Bon Arm Richard operating off the coast of Vietnam for the purpose of observing airstrike support. On 29 June, a converted S-2F aircraft was sent in from the Coral Sea for transportation. The flight plan called for a trip over Nha Trang, Da Nang, and on north to the Coral Sea operating in the Gulf of Tonkin. Flights must be scheduled from the Tonsonut Airport with extreme care or typical waiting times on the ramp are well in excess of an hour. As was mentioned, the flight plan called for a flight northeast from Saigon over the large hydroelectric plant located between Saigon and Nha Trang, and then on over the Nha Trang area. The geography of Vietnam changes drastically as one flies north from the Saigon-Cholon area. 
whereas the Mekong Delta is very flat with dense low jungle growth. The area north of Saigon is typified by large forests with dense undergrowth and mountains which rise to well over 10,000 feet further north. The Japanese-built hydroelectric plant seen here supplies basic electricity for most of South Vietnam. The train, a large military installation on the coast of Vietnam, has a major air base as well as the Vietnamese Naval Academy. The Viet Cong had mortared the airstrip and the Naval Academy the night prior to overfly to this area. In and around the mountains along the coastline, there is large farming activity with various crops in evidence. At the present time, the U.S. Navy has a heavy commitment to patrol the inland and inshore waters to prevent the Viet Cong infiltration via the sea. The Da Nang area forms the primary U.S. military base at the present, and virtually all U.S. military logistics support and supplies to the area come via Da Nang. As can be seen, the junk fishing traffic is unbelievable, and even in the Da Nang area, junks operate freely along with U.S. military ships. Certainly a percentage of these junks are operated by the Viet Cong disguised as fishermen. As of June, the maintenance of airfield security still posed a major problem. The Coral Sea was operating in the Gulf of Tonkin with its primary mission being the attack of various targets in North Vietnam. The carrier had been in operation in this area approximately five months as of that time. The general weather in the Gulf of Tonkin was extremely hot and humid, although the seas were exceedingly calm. Because of the heavy airstrike traffic, the COD orbited the carrier for some time, with the arrested landing or arrival at the carrier an interesting experience. The Coral Sea was operating at that time F-4s, A4s, A3s, and a large number of A1 spads. F4s and F8s were also used for air cover. Air strikes from the Coral Sea were made on virtually a round-the-clock basis, and a tremendous tonnage of ordnance was being delivered to North Vietnam daily. Bombs included 250, 500, and 1,000 pounders shown here which were stacked in abundance on the flight deck, as well as the hangar deck, enlisted men's mess, and so forth. Deck crews were standing 18-hour watches seven days a week. And after five months on station, general proficiency was an obvious concern, although the accident rate was surprisingly low. The Coral Sea, because of its location so far north, was operating cap missions and maintaining aircraft on deck alert in case of an attack by MiGs operating from Hainan or North Vietnam. Airstrikes were planned based on reconnaissance data, and during the tour aboard the Coral Sea, several major strikes were launched against targets in North Vietnam. A3 aircraft were used for bombing missions, but primarily as aerial tankers to aid in the recovery of strike aircraft returning to the carrier. One of the most efficient airplanes in operation throughout Vietnam is the old Douglas A1, which is capable of high-accuracy dive bombing. This aircraft can also accept reasonably heavy damage, whereas some of the newer jets are a little less rugged. Despite the large number of missions flown by all pilots, the general accident record was very low, and overall proficiency outstanding considering the operating conditions.
Because of extreme airstrike operations of the carrier, replenishment activities were pursued approximately every three days. Fuel and ordnance were transferred to the carrier as well as mail and other necessities. The Cimarron, shown here, is the oldest operating hull currently in service in the Navy. Accompanying the Coral Sea were various submarines, destroyers, DLGs, and so forth. Certainly appropriate based on the operating area. On leaving the Coral Sea, a flight was made to the Bonham Richard carrier, which was operating in the South China Sea. The operations on board this carrier were decidedly different than those observed on the Coral Sea. Because of the southern location of this carrier, little attention was paid to the possibility of air attack, and missions flown from the Bonham Richard were primarily directed toward targets in the Mekong Delta. These targets would be identified by a forward air controller, coordinated through various combat centers, and every hour and a half, an airstrike was launched from the Bonham Richard, from daylight until dusk. Flights into the Saigon area always pose a risk because the area is heavily ringed with VC, and the possibility of attack is ever present. Thus, an A-1 escort was provided. This highly interesting tour was concluded on the 3rd of July. The Navy personnel contacted were extremely cooperative and typical of all U.S. military in Vietnam, exhibited outstanding morale. Evident to each member of the team was the fact the Navy is faced with a unique task with many complications, both natural and man-made. Control of infiltration by the sea and inland waterway warfare will call for drastically different military techniques. Certainly, the Navy will assume an increasing responsibility in both counterinsurgency and limited warfare. And Vietnam will be typical of this new category of war.